This, if I were to just focus on any, all African musicians, I would be writing probably volumes and volumes of books, but given the two-year nature of my program, I had to narrow it a little bit. So I'm focusing specifically on Ghanaian hip life artists. Um, one of the first to under the genre hip life, which combines hip hop and high life. Uh, I interviewed Reggie Rockstone. I won't be talking about him in this presentation. Instead, I'll be talking about one um, who's a little bit newer to, to the genre. His name is Blitz the Ambassador. He was born and raised in Accra, currently lives in Brooklyn, but attended university in, um, in Ohio, um, who's actually releasing an album at the end of this month called Afropolitan Dreams. And I kid you not, I did not know that when I started the research show. It was one of those journalistic gold mines because it fits in so perfectly with what I've been doing. Um, so I'll be looking at that. I'll be introducing you guys to Blitz, talking about the interviews that I've had with him, what I've learned about how he interprets um, and identifies as, as an Af Afropolitan. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about the term itself, um, who coined it, what it means, how it was used initially, and the ways in which it's kind of been contested and challenged since then. Um, so in 2005, a, a, a novelist of Nigerian and Ghanaian descent, Taye Selassie, her right here, um, she wrote a short essay for this small British online magazine called The Lit Magazine. Um, and it was called Bye Bye Bar Bar, which for those of you who are not familiar with Eddie Murphy's movie Coming to America, um, it's a reference to that movie. Um, but in the essay, she basically gives you um, the anatomy of an Afropolitan. Um, and I pulled out one of her main arguments um, here in this bullet point. Like so many young African people living and working in cities around the globe, they belong to no single geography, but feel at home in many. They, read we, um, since Selassie also identifies as an Afropolitan, she actually currently lives in Italy, and that's where she does most of her work and writing, but has lived in um, Boston and Brooklyn, uh, so she's been all over. Um, they, read we, are Afropolitans, coming soon or collected already at a law firm, chem lab, jazz lounge near you. Um, so. One of my first questions was, what differentiates an Afropolitan from someone who just identifies as an African immigrant? And based on Taye Selassie's essay, it would be that rather than um, exploring professional avenues that might deal strictly with medicine or politics, um, Afropolitans are now sort of empowered to explore more creative outlets, like Selassie herself, and like some of the other um, people that I would argue could be um, identified as Afropolitans. Andrew Dosunmu, the Nigerian filmmaker, Wange Chimutu, who was born in Kenya but has lived in Brooklyn. She's a visual artist since like the early 1990s and continues to work there. Her, her work has been shown at the Brooklyn Museum most recently. Um, Lupita Nyong'o needs no introduction. I know you guys are familiar with her, probably maybe more than you'd like to be at this point. Um, <laughs> and Chimamanda Ngozi Gichi Adichie, um, who's one of my personal heroes. I, We'll have to cut myself off from there, otherwise I'll talk about her too much as well. But um, all of these individuals, because of their international exposures, can all identify as Afropolitan. Um, so you might notice that even with the selection that I've, I've picked out for this presentation, um, there are not many musicians here. There are no musicians here, actually, which is another reason why I was sort of interested in exploring that avenue. Um, and that's where Blitz came in. Blitz. The ambassador, that's his stage name. His, um, his real name is Samuel Bazawule. He was born in Accra in a small neighborhood in the greater Accra region. Um, he's 32 years old. And when he was, he actually grew up with a pretty middle class at one point, but maybe like very working class background in Accra. Um, his father was unemployed for a time, so his family was struggling a little bit. But he told me that he came into hip hop basically when Public Enemy came and gave a concert in Accra. And up until that point, every, he had felt very distant from the hip hop movement that had begun um, in the late 80s, early 90s in New York City. But it wasn't until an American hip hop group actually came to Ghana that he felt almost invited into that world. Um, and at that point, he began listening to the music. His older brother was a big fan and would kind of smuggle home these cassette tapes with the music. Um, when he would come home to visit from boarding school, it would sh be shared like throughout his friendship circles. Blitz um, had this sort of 
facility with interpreting American English hip hop slang and would then become this sort of scribe for his friends and write down the lyrics so that his friends could then follow along and participate with the music. Um, this is when he was in his early teens. Um, so his, his becoming this sort of like informal scribe within his friendship circles then translated into Blitz writing his own lyrics or incorporating into, into the songs that he was writing um, lyrics that were a little bit more culturally, culturally relevant to Ghanaians. Um, and eventually he just began writing his own original content. Um, when he was 18, his father was able to get a job at the UN, which gave him the ability to send his children overseas to school. So Blitz ended up going to Kent University in Ohio. His sister went to school in the UK. Um, and once Blitz was here, that's when he really began to sort of jumpstart his music career. After he graduated from Kent, he moved to Brooklyn, um, which is where he currently, he actually lives like one subway stop away from me in Brooklyn, which I didn't know until we did our interview last October, but that's where he's lived um, primarily for the past couple of years, making, of course, frequent stops in places like Atlanta. He goes back to Accra. He gave a, a concert in Accra actually earlier this January. Um, but he actually has a slightly different interpretation of Afropolitanism, um, which I'll get to a little bit later, but his genre is hip life, as I mentioned earlier, which is this synthesis of hip hop and high life music. High life music originated in Ghana in the 1880s, so it's a very traditional form of music there, sort of like the way in America we claim jazz music as having originated here, which may or may not be true. That's another conversation <laughs> for another time. Um, but it's very, I mean, it's something that, it, it, it's almost like a universal language, hip, high life music in Ghana. So a lot of his songs, especially in his um, third album, Native Son, combine musical and instrumental elements of high life music layered with rap lyrics um, and sometimes even hip hop percussion beats um, in a single song. And what I find especially interesting about Blitz is if you listen to his lyrics, um, he will combine influences and speak about icons that are prominent in both the African American community and the African community. So in one song, he might reference Desmond Tutu and Maya Angelou, or Public Enemy and Fela Kuti in a single line. Um, and I think that that really reflects so directly um, his multiple sources of inspiration for his music. Um, and one of the texts that sort of guided me through my research was um, Dr. Halifu Osumare's um, Hip Life in Ghana, the West African Indigenization of Hip Hop. Um, and in her book, she sort of sets forth this idea of the arc of mutual inspiration, which means that hip hop didn't necessarily, we shouldn't think of um, these cultural products as beginning in one place and then sort of going to another place after that. She argues that these sort of changes and these inspirations are happening simultaneously across the Atlantic. Um, and I was actually surprised when I was doing research in Ghana last summer that I would speak to Ghanaians who firmly believe that hip hop originated there. Um, and offered to show me YouTube videos that were dated in the like 1970s that predated, okay, um, that predated anything that could have started up in the Bronx in New York. Um, so I just wanna show you a quick snippet of some of Blitz's music. This is his most recent music video. I actually don't know if the sound is gonna work, but we'll see. It's called uh, Make You No Forget. And it actually features, Sian Kuti. I don't think this is hooked up with audio. <coughs> I forgot to test it before. Oh. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll save it for the end if I have some time. I'll pause it for now. Um, anyway, this, this music video was shot in Jamestown, a, um, a neighborhood in Accra. <coughs> He did it um, when he was there most recently in January, and he's still working on, this song is going to be on his Afropolitan Dreams album. Um, so when we go back to this idea of the Afropolitan and how recently, um, even though Taya's essay came out in 2005, a lot of people have been critiquing the idea because there are a lot of class implications and a lot of implications of privilege that come with Afropolitan because not everyone has the means to leave their home country. Not everyone has the means to get a scholarship to go to school abroad. Um, but some people argue that Taye is sort of implying that these are almost prerequisites to become Afropolitan or to identify as such. But what I found, um, what really struck me when I was having conversations with Blitz is that he is sort of envisioning this sort of 
reimagining of an Afropolitan in which you need not even leave your home country in order to achieve that status or to claim that identity, um, which I tried to encapsulate in this bulky quote. Um, but just to highlight some parts, he, he says, I want us to start thinking, we as in Africans, that we can be cosmopolitan in Kumasi, another big city in Ghana, in Accra, Tamale, in Abuja, and Lome, um, and that we shouldn't think of it necessarily as an African who has been exposed to the West, whichever West you, you choose to define that as. Um, it's not a relationship between the Western world and Africa. It's a relationship between Africans in Africa and how they deal with their surroundings in the larger diaspora. This idea is actually also reflected in his album because um, as I attempted to show you in that music video, he collaborates with Nigerian artists, he collaborates with um, artists from North Africa, Southern Africa. So he's really sort of trying to embrace this idea, not even really of pan-Africanism, but trans-Africanism. Um, and since Afropolitan, that term um, is almost 10 years old now, uh, what I'm also sort of exploring toward the end of my research is ways that we can start to rethink how one can be cosmopolitan within the continent um, and how, and I feel like that will challenge these sort of notions of Western exposure as a means of social elitism, um, which is really one of the bigger critiques of Afropolitan. Um, so just to sum it up, uh, it's, it's been a really, really interesting, a, as an American who just has a personal interest in this kind of music, um, I think it's really important to just to remember um, that Africans are not always so concerned with these Western exposures in order to advance themselves. And I think Blitz is um, his generation, especially of the creatives in his generation, are really starting to push the boundaries of that, which as a journalist, I'm always um, sort of on the lookout for these new stories. And um, his music, if you listen to it, which I encourage, I think really conveys that in all of his different albums. Um, and, and I think it's the beginning of a conversation that we really, really need to start having a little bit more of. So hopefully this is a start for that for everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
And what I want to do is just to interrogate a little bit the, the, the idea of, uh, of constructions of space and why it's so important, how this importance is maintained through um, customary practice. Um, so this is the town. It's divided up, and I will just go rapidly through um, some of the spatial divisions in the town. And they are very important. This is, uh, this is the town of Sandra Mjini, and you have three quarters, Harumwa Mji, which is the bulk of the town, which is called the Free Quarter or the Noble Quarter, Bifuni, which is the Fisherman's Quarter, and Mirareni, this tiny little bit down the bottom here, which is the former Slave Quarter. And relationships between, and there's very different, um, uh, very uh, visible differences. Uh, Harum Wanji, the Free Quarter, is very built up, a lot of stone buildings with these monumental um, public squares, um, whereas the other two quarters are a little less built up. Um, and relationships between um, the quarters are managed both through customary marriage practice and also through uh, the spatial disposition of uh, lineages, metro lineages in the town. And I've got some of them mapped out here. And you can see that I, they, they do cluster in, in, they do have some patterns to them, but they're also spatially diffused. You do have houses of different lineages in different parts of town. Um, so the customary practice, uh, which uh, is known as ada, um, which is from the Arabic word custom, is part of the uh, age system um, rituals which transform young men into elders. There are all sorts of rituals associated with it, but one of them is um, eating within the village. Um, and different groups eat with each other, but only within their particular um, quarter or village, if you like. So in this case, a social village, which is a quarter of the town. So this com ritual commensality um, is, is very important in constructing um, notions of belonging. Um, different uh, inya, different matrilineages will have responsibility for different meals within a particular customary marriage. <coughs> and everybody within the quarter will be um, in not only entitled but expected to eat. Um, so the, 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 the bonds between the different lineages within the quarter are articulated through these ritual meals. Um, and this makes it very difficult because the, uh, the meals are provided by the bride's family and eaten by um, the groom's social, um, his age set, makes it very difficult to have inter-village um, marriages because otherwise you have firstly people um, not eating the correct meal, and secondly, just the physical problems of transporting meals. It does happen, and it's quite unusual. You see taxis going past with big plates of rice, but it's extremely difficult, really socially, to negotiate these meals between different villages. So the cohesion through eating, through commensality, is one of the ways that um, quarters, that spatial units, are bound together um, in the Comores. Um, so what does this mean um, for the diaspora? Um, these Comorians um, are, whoop, ooh, what there? sorry, I've lost the, the last few images. Um, there's a large Comorian diaspora in Zanzibar. Um, Zanzibar was a popular destination from the 19th century for Comorians who um, have <coughs> for a long time constituted emigrant communities in the Indian Ocean. Um, they were particularly well um, thought of in Zanzibar under the British administration. Uh, they succeeded in particularly in the civil service and the police and uh, as teachers and also as religious leaders. Um, but part of the way that they set up um, the social structures in Zanzibar was to replicate um, the social, uh, the socio-spatial um, structures. Uh, sorry, Jimmy doesn't mean anything. I have no idea why this is done. Um, this, so you will have to just imagine. Um, the villages of um, Ngazija, Grand Comor, were represented in Zanzibar as <coughs> socio-spatial units. They didn't necessarily have a spatial coherence in the sense that in Zanzibar they weren't, there weren't particular spatial units that corresponded to particular villages in the Comores. But there were what were called counties um, in Zanzibar that provided a focal point for the Comorian community um, around these social spatial units. So they referred to their home villages or the home villages of their ancestors in the Comores in order to organize themselves and to, and to manage customary practice in Zanzibar 
along similar lines um, to the way it had been managed in, in the Comores. So life cycle rituals such as marriages, um, circumcision, and funerals were organized within these uh, social villages, if you like, um, to which people adhered largely by matrilineal uh, principles. The matrilineal system from the Comores was exported um, to Zanzibar as far as these affiliations to villages were concerned. So this system um, of a, a number of villages that varied between 16 and 20 um, villages in Zanzibar that represented spatial villages um, in uh, the Comores managed intra-community relationships uh, within Zanzibar, but also managed relationships between Zanzibar and the Comores, so between members of the Comorian diaspora in um, Zanzibar and the home villages. There were various reasons for this strategy, but one is, of course, that the Comores depended and continued to depend on remittances um, and links with the outside world. So not only do they need to keep people um, engaged, but they need to also have a way for people to travel outside. So they have to maintain these links between um, Comorians at home and Comorians in diaspora. And so this is done along um, socio-spatial lines that each village has a link with um, uh, a, a social village, if you like, um, in Zanzibar. And what this meant, amongst other things, is that Comorians in Zanzibar were encouraged to marry into um, the villages in, in the Comores. And because it's a matrilineal system um, and it's hypogamous, which means that the women have high status, uh, brides generally for Comorian men had to be sought in the home islands. Men, uh, Comorian men, couldn't marry um, outside the Comorian community. Um, in Zanzibar because the brides that they would find in other Comorian communities in Zanzibar would have been a lower status from a Comorian point of view. Um, so the, these hypogamous marriage practices and the spatial um, relationships uh, between the Comores and Zanzibar meant that these links were two minutes, okay, um, were maintained such that people were required to go back to their villages of origin. Um, and I will wrap up with my two minutes. So what uh, this means is that there was a, um, a tension set up between uh, Comorians and Diaspora <coughs> and Zanzibar and Comorians and the homeland um, based on these desires for the homeland to incorporate Comorians um, in Diaspora into customary practice in the Comores. And then both a resistance and a desire on the part of Comorians in Zanzibar to, uh, to maintain these links a resistance in the sense that this, um, these customary marriages were extremely expensive and uh, people didn't necessarily want to undergo two marriages if they'd already married in Zanzibar and then go back to the village and marry there again. But also a desire to maintain the links, um, partly because men needed a source of ride, rides and partly because um, they, particularly in later years in Zanzibar, post-revolutionary Zanzibar, um, needed to have an escape route in case they had to go somewhere else and political, um, times of political um, unrest. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, the way I, uh, in my paper at least, I'm trying to ana analyze this is using Henri Lefebvre's um, tripartite analysis of, of space, that you have spatial practice, you have representations of space, and you have um, uh, representational spaces. And the spatial practices are the practices that Comorians practice in both places, in Zanzibar and in the Comores, um, whereby their um, social relationships are um, articulated through these um, spatial, but often not emplaced spatial relationships, um, and creating in Zanzibar representations of spaces, that is, these spaces that aren't um, emplaced, and these are, through the spatial practices, feeding into the representational uh, spaces in the Comoros that are the very real spaces that reflect that, if you like, are mirrors of um, these uh, social spaces in, in Zanzibar. Um, uh, so I, and I will stop there, I think, because uh, otherwise I could go on forever. But, uh, yeah. <laughs>
part of the project that I'm um, not necessarily the project, but in my area of expertise, which is post-colonial studies and migration and diaspora and identity formation are one of the themes. So I'm looking at Adisha's novel, and um, I'll, I'll just read, try as much as possible to read and see where 12 minutes will take me. I hope it will be coherent in a way. Adisha's novel, Americana, is a voluminous text. It's about 477 pages that depicts various narrative strands on migrant experiences and the nature of the newly constituted Nigerian diaspora in Euro-American metropolises. The narrative strands evident in the novel cover the local and transnational migration, migrants' con constant movements in the Euro-American metropolitan spaces and return migration. As a result, the text demands us to ask how we can con conceptualize to the fullest the nature of contemporary Nigerian and West African migration and the construction of diasporic exper experiences and identities. This, of course, recognizes, um, I have at the back of my mind, uh, Adisha's illuminating speech uh, available on the internet where she discusses the idea of what African writing and um, the danger against stereotypes in the danger in, uh, of a single story. So I have that at the back of my mind. So I thus postulate that the novel expansive in its uh, coverage of narrative strands and different migrants' experiences in different cities and socioeconomic places is indicative of the multiplicities or many stories to draw on Adeshi, marking the growth of the new Nigerian diaspora. I suggest that the novel demands that we perceive contemporary Nigerian diasporic experiences as characterized by, dif uh, by difference and not homogeneous. So how do I... Um, define this concept of uh, multiple experiences. I consider the concept of migration in its broadest sense as discussed by Salazar, where he points out that migration in its broadest sense is much more than mere movement between places. It is always embedded in wider processes of meaning making. In other words, migration in particular and mobility in general are socio-cultural constructs involving important imaginary discursive dimensions. I'm interested in the suggestion that we perceive migration as a more complex phenomenon. This also allows us to draw on Eliot and Uri's discussion on mobilities as movement in different forms, where transnational movements and diasporic experiences are related with globalization and how global movements compel the migrants to adapt to new conditions. Of course, it brings in uh, De Soto's ideas on tact, um, the tactics of survival of the outsider and so forth, because we are dealing with the city as the metropolitan spaces, and so there's always the ideas on walking the city and tactics of the outsider, which I also have at the back of my mind. The narrative style is also important in underscoring the need to examine the new migrant experiences from the concept of homogeneity, homogeneity and hence multiplicities. I draw on Ragat's discussion on the constitution of narrative identity in relation to the nature of the storyline. He is questioning of whether it is possible to tell a full story in a linear narrative and whether a linear narrative in its coverage of a life story is able to tie together with a golden thread a single narrative voice is indicative of the need for a complex narrative method in telling life stories and by extension in analyzing given stories. Such concerns are, are significant considering that Americana describes the life narratives of Ifemulu or Beans and other migra migrants albeit at a fictional level and as such multiple narrative voices with Ifemulu as the dominant and a secular narrative fully captures the contemporary Nigerian migrants' uh, diasporic experiences. It is for this, reason, for this reason that I concur with Ragad's proposition that in an effort to understand life stories, in this case Adisha's migrant life stories in different Euro-American spaces, we must allow for multiplicities in the way individuals go about constructing a sense of selfhood. And that life stories can be used in the study of lives, tradition, without the assumption of a definitive or single storyline, and hence without assuming a singularity of identity or even selfhood. With this in mind, I, I then uh, examine some of uh, the instances in, in the novel, and uh, I sort of start off by looking at how the novel describes Nigerian mobilities in the form of internal migrations. The mobilities include Ifemulu's upbringing in Lagos and her migration to university and Sunka 
multi-directional movements evident in Obinze, a family schoolmate and childhood lover and his university professor mother from Tsuka to Lagos and then from Lagos back to Tsuka University. Uh, other mobilities are evident in Antu Uji's transformation from being a poor and unemployed medical school graduate uh, who was um, crashing in with a family, struggling family to a posh house in <coughs> at Dolphin Estate in Lagos, which of course did not even pay one kobo, uh, as retorted by um, the innocent Ifemulu, as a, benef as a benefit from her relationship with a powerful and wealthy member of the ruling Lagos military elite called the General. And there are socio-economic mobilities as reflected in some of the characters' attempts to earn a living either through transactional relations as noted in Uju's relationship with the general and the presence of 419 schemers such as Chief Omenka who would ostentatiously donate his fraudulently acquired wealth to sponsor church projects. These different mobilities unfold in a depressed pre-civilian government-led Nigerian economy where lecturers and students were always uh, on strike, unemployment is rampant, and services such as electricity supply and are pathetically intermittent. There's a student demonstration where one of the placards read, no water, no electricity. The novel's cyclic plot and narrative style gives prominence to the imaginaries of and yearnings for migration in the contemporary Nigerian experiences, and thus depicts the interesting yarns marking the growth of Nigeria's new diaspora. The novel begins in the present. If Emily is contemplating uh, about her impending return to Nigeria from the US, then through flashbacks <coughs> goes back to her upbringing in Nigeria, life with friends in Lagos, her university days, experiences about her young love with Obinze until she migrates to the US to join Auntie Uju and struggles through loneliness, poverty, a string of unfulfilling relationships, rises to establish a flourishing career as a writer or a blogger until she decides to return home, you know, to find her true love, Obinze, which she eventually does at the end of the novel. It should be underscored that evident in this cyclical narrative is the prominence of Nigerians and West Africans, just as other migrants, yearn for upward in social mobilities and physical movement, whether internal or transnational. These mobilities resonate with the multiple metaphoric and physical movements that are defined by Salazar as constitutive of migration in its broadest sense. Hence, there is a way in which Adeshi's narrative style, by giving providence to various internal mobilities and transnational migrations, um, owing to various post-colonial and personal reasons, places the depicted Nigerians and West Africans in general much in the same position as Hall's assertion that the psyche and identities of the Caribbeans are based on a constant yearning to migrate to the western most metropolitan cities. The narrative, cyclic and complex as it is, has multiple strands. Its autobiographical streak depicts a family's growth from a mere high school girl to a, in a poor family until she rises to be a, a very prominent uh, blogger in the United States. Um, we also see her uh, moving out of Auntie Uju's uh, home flat and becoming a university student and subsequently engaging in a number of uh, relationships, multicultural, multiracial. Um, one of them is with Kurt, a rich white young man, and the African-American uh, academic Blaine. These experiences, especially her relationships, transformed her into a cosmopolitan diasporic character. She interacted with different social and racial groups and got introduced into the business and work world, where she ended up getting a green card, developing into a professional blogger, and achieving writing fellowships at prestigious institutions in the United States. The road to integration is marked by chance meetings, such as meeting Kurt while uh, working as a house sitter and playing in a train, social networks. Um, Kurt introduced her to one of his friend's associates who offered her a job, and that's the right to a green card, and personal initiative. Her blog ended up providing her, vo her a vocation and the fellowships at different universities. The text in its portrayal of a family's experience, experience therefore presents the narrative um, as a life story, albeit fictional, where the main protagonist, a family, is portrayed reflecting upon her experiences and coming in terms with alienating and depressing moments as well as survival in the U.S., survival and success. What is significant, however, okay, let me skip this. Um, I think what is significant in, in this is that Ife Mulu enmeshes her narrative about the daily life experiences 
with the U.S. culture of participation in the social media. As the, no, uh, as the novel's narrator, she interlinks the traditional narrative about her life experiences with the new media narratives about her, about her encounters and thoughts about topical American experiences and social political trajectories on her blog. This resonates with Elliot and U Uri's discussion that that links mobilities such as transnational and transcultural experiences with globalization and enables the constitution of adaptive identities and new networks. So if Emily's blog indeed allowed her to engage in newer cyber mobilities through the circulation of her discourses about race, intellectual concerns, national politics, African-American, and African ethics, and I, I particularly liked her concerns on hair politics and so forth. It was quite interesting. Um, the novel's expansive treatment also allows us to enter and witness the migrant experiences unfolding in different Euro-American settings. There's a way in which the text looks at different settings um, that characters enter into and we're able to see the multiplicities of the experiences and how the uh, migrants are able to introduce uh, strategies and tactics to place themselves within the American experience and so forth and the opportunities thereof. Um, I'll just deal with anti Ujus. Um, the different settings defining anti Ujus uh, transnational experience in the U.S. are significant. <coughs> if Emily's first contact with anti Uju as an Americana is telephonic and as such she places the anti <coughs> in the Cosby televisual image, only to have this image destabilized for the real anti Uju drives an old Toyota hatchback and stays in a derelict um, that's poorly lit and pest infested flatlands in Brooklyn. Furthermore, Anti Uji juggles different jobs, most of them that Ifemuli never imagined, especially for a medical doctor. She was barely surviving. Anti Uji never brought never bought what she needed. Instead she bought what was on sale and made herself need it. Although she was reading for her US medical registration exams, uh, her life led the kind of opulence popularly imagined as characterizing <coughs> migrants' life experiences in the, uh, in the America, that is African migrants. Socially, she felt vulnerable and felt incomplete, even when she eventually passed the registration <coughs> exams and found employment as a medical doctor, she felt incomplete without a man. She dated various West African men until she got married to a fellow migrant from Ghana, uh, but their marriage was later estranged as the husband descended into a nervous breakdown after the deployment of his son onto one of America's battle fronts in the fight against global terrorism. Um, these built and lived uh, social spaces that Uju takes us into confirm further the various experiences that the contemporary African migrants experience as they struggle to integrate into the American society. The irony, as noted by Nagbara, is that they still felt alienated even if they had integrated into the different rhythms of the American society. There's a grim scene where Uju's son, Daik, uh, attempted suicide. It's, it's one of those examples of the uh, alienation, the paradox of integration and failure, as it were, uh, anxiety, perhaps, of the migrants. Obinze's experiences in the UK complicates the novel's treatment of the image of contemporary Nigerian migrant conditions. Um, the UK experiences are juxtaposed with Ifemelu's US experiences to provide a fuller picture of the Nigerian and West African diasporic experiences. Um, but what I think is important <coughs> here is the way in which um, Obinze's experience allow us to map further the nature of contemporary Nigerian and West African diasporic uh, experiences. The metropolitan space is used, that is London, by Adichie to depict the traditional image of a displaced migrant. Obinze felt out of place. Uh, he could not find a job because he did not have a, uh, a national insurance number and gets into this slave-like relationship. He's given, um, in other words, how do mig migrants negotiate with these spaces? Uh, Obinze uh, had to integrate himself into the rhythm of London experiences through deceptive means. Um, this included entering into the spaces of um, illegal and underground, the spaces of the illegal and underground networks, where Nosa, a fellow Nigerian, loaned him his national insurance number for a percentage of his salary. So there's the trope of 
a Nigerian in Lagos as having to hustle in order to survive. And Adeshi sort of complicates this, in, in my view, by showing that these migrant spaces that Obinze enter also introduce us to the hustling that contemporary Niger uh, migrants have to engage in the Western me metropolises. The trope seems to be that if Nigerians have to hustle in Lagos, they have to hustle further and sometimes enter the underground spaces of the Euro-American host cities if they are to make it. However, the hustling differs according to one's migrant status and capability. For instance, Emenike, who was quite cunning from his early childhood, ex experiences back in Nigeria while schoolmates with Obinze, Obinze and others charmed his way into marrying um, a rich old white woman and so entered the posh spaces of the UK society while others, such as Obinze's cousin, Nicholas and wife Ojugo, who migrated to the UK legally as skilled migrants, steadily worked into the UK economy to own their homes and to struggle, raise their children to the middle class parity of Kumon, extra maths, English, science lessons, and piano lessons. That's Obinze, his cousin, and the rest of the contemporary Nigerian migrants um, that he associates with. Uh, through the spaces they take us, depict the different experiences encountered by more um, encountered by the new migrants. Um, and to conclude, the examination of the new Nigerian uh, dias diasporan experiences on the basis of the inherent multiplicities in mobilities, specific migrant encounters, and integrations into the Euro-American host cities allows us to go beyond the totalizing bleak image where the diasporic experiences are perceived as largely dislocating and stifling. Americana complicates this traditional image. It describes the new Nigerian diaspora's experiences as multi-layered and characterized by different successes, breaking into new grounds, I mean, if a male is blogging, and failures. Obinza is deported. He tries to an arranged marriage, but then he's caught and is deported back to Nigeria, but rises to become one of the best, uh, uh, wealthiest, one of the wealthiest uh, Lagos um, businessmen. The author even complicates this by adding the dimension of return migration. Um, that's what I was just talking. Obinza is forced to return back home, but he rose to become a successful real estate in Lagos. And if a mule is, is voluntary, she willingly returns to America, just as other returnees whom we encounter in the last part of the novel. Thus, it is perhaps on the trope of return migration, especially if a mule is and Adich, that Adichie complicates the image of transnational migration by underscoring that the new Nigerian diaspora is in most cases still connected with the original home. Transnational migration is a temporary move to acquire the skills and social economic capital that will equip them to hustle competitively when back in Lagos. Thank you. I want to start off by saying that um, I'm a product of transnationalism, and so transnationalism within the African diaspora is very important. Um, so I wanted to point out that me personally, uh, Latino descent, uh, I was born in Chicago to parents that were migrant workers. My father was born in Mexico, and his father was born in Arizona. So my, my experience as uh, an individual is very much part of uh, the transnational theme. Uh, my paper is titled Uprooted, African Americans in Mexico, International Propaganda, Migration, and the Resistance Against U.S. Racial Hegemony. My paper reflects the international diasporic political and physical connections of African Americans to Mexico as reflected in my paper's title. My hope is that I can contribute to the greater story of the African diaspora, but specifically my historical interest is with regard to African Americans in Latin America, but really the specific connection that they have to Mexico as a whole. So I'm going to begin, read, I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to point to some examples and I'm going to reiterate my conclusion. Uh, before and after the official demise of slavery in the United States, Mexico positioned itself in a way to attempt to counteract the racial hegemony the U.S. had long established. With this in mind, Mexico attempted to create a relationship with African Americans. Mexico positioned itself as a counterweight to combat the, racial, the U.S. racial hegemony granting African Americans the possibility of a voice, of a heard voice on the international stage. My paper is about the weaving of the international relationship between Mexico, African Americans, and the use of propaganda 
and how it impacted Mexico, the U.S., and African Americans. The relationship between the U.S. and Mexico produced propagandistic motivations. One of the key things to my paper is propaganda, how we view it, its interpretation, and how someone can say something, but it can mean a variety of different things. Um, so it's about the propagandistic motivations and ploys regarding African American interaction with Mexico during this period, the 19th century and into the 20th century. Mexico sought to exploit the position of African Americans in the U.S., and the U.S. sought to exploit the paranoia surrounding African Americans' alleged actions in the greater role of U.S. history. The larger hegemonic battle between the U.S. and Mexico shaped their pivotal roles in the successes and failures of African American international endeavors with regard to Mexico. I argue that Mexico hoped to combat the United States' Western Hemisphere domination by assisting African Americans via colonizing efforts, political rhetoric, the <coughs> denouncement of U.S. slavery, and possible international revolutionary alliances. The United States hoped to impede the spread of radicalism in its country, loss of agricultural workers, combat the international focus of their own racism, and denote Mexico as inferior in the process. Overall, the United States hoped to establish their international hegemonic dominance over areas and people they deemed inferior. The earlier abolition of slavery in Mexico and the welcoming environment Mexico presented to African American people created a vivid testimony of anti-slavery sentiment in Mexico during the 19th century. And I bring in mind um, the conflicts of the Texas Revolution and the Mexican-American War and its role uh, regarding slavery and Mexico's stance on slavery as a way to counteract America. The migration and successes and attempts made by African Americans during the late portion of the 19th century and early portion of the 20th century seem, unsurpri seem unsur unsurprising considering the social and cultural sentiments of Mexico towards black Americans from earlier periods. Although some moves of criticism towards the United States regarding its position on slavery arose from conflicts between the two nations, two, two periods of two moments in history that I mentioned right now, Texas Revolution and the Mexican and American War, Mexico typically reviled slavery and historically took positions against slavery during this period. Mexico produced the equivalent of the international promised land for African Americans. At least it was presented and perceived that way. This optimistic view must consider the fact that mer during Mexico's primary wars with the United States in the 19th century, it made it a point to demonstrate its position on slavery, its view of U.S. slavery, and its alleged hospitable environments to African Americans. Now, I have several examples in my paper, but there's uh, four that I want to focus on that really showcase the, the uh, complexity of the propaganda, the complexity of the situation between Mexico, the U.S., and African Americans in this kind of tripartite kind of uh, existence. Uh, the first is a proposal by Senator James Lane of Kansas uh, during the Civil War that proposed the, and we have to remember that this was uh, within the decade of the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that signed over a huge annexation of Mexican land over to the United States. Senator James Lane, during this period, it was in 1864, he proposed this at Congress suggested that the U.S. create a buffer state between Mexico and the United States, taking over land in Texas and New Mexico, spread into Colorado, some in Arizona, and to colonize this area with African Americans. He proposed to move several million African Americans that, ha that um, were in the U.S. to this area as a buffer. There's a lot going on within this, this proposal, and one thing that I point out is that during this time, at the height of U.S. racial hegemony for white America, they deemed, I mean, obviously, I don't have to point this out, but African Americans in a troubling position, right, in the U.S. Also, Mexico and Mexicans were in a position that were, was complicated by U.S. racial hegemony. So th this proposal suggested to move African Americans as a way to essentially buffer Mexico and the United States because this was literally less than a decade of very... Um, inhospitable areas with the U.S. It was a big conflict. The next example that I want to point out is a proposal by Senator Ben Tillman during the Spanish-American War. After they had taken over the Philippines, they proposed, well, Ben Tillman, South Carolina, proposed that they colonize parts of the Philippines with African Americans also, similar to James Lane's proposal, both times during heights of conflict with people that the U.S. deemed inferior, right? And so I think it's important to bring this up both senators were abolitionists, yet they were staunchly racist. So I think abolitionism 
and racism are very complicated within this time period. <coughs> we can't think of abolition as, as this really um, colored word, right? And two other examples, this is 19th century. The other two examples that I'm bringing up are during the Mexican Revolution, another time of conflict and heightened hostility between the U.S. and Mexico. We have the occupation of Veracruz. We have General Pershing's expedition into Mexico. And another key point of economic dilemma is oil. Mexico, during the Mexican Revolution, decided to nationalize their oil and vacate all foreign powers. One, U.S. foreign oil companies. So this was at the height of, uh, again, American and Mexican hostility. The example that I bring up is Juan Uribe, a Mexican lawyer, also a part of the Mexican government, also part landowner in Baja, California. He went to Los Angeles in 1919, spoke to a group of predominantly African Americans <coughs> at a Baptist church, and proposed that they move to Mexico. Several million he proposed, similar to Lane and Tillman, except this is coming now from a Mexican. Um, during this point of a hostility, I bring this up because it seems like there's retractive moments in the, this, this period of hostility that uh, Mexico would propose such a proposition, right? Uh, during the Texas Revolution, Mexican-American War, the Mexican government adamantly spoke out against slavery as a way to thumb their nose, I suppose, at the U.S., whether it was really motivated by their sincere endowment of anti-slavery movement and sentiment or whether it was a way to international movement, uh, you know, propaganda, right, again. The second, the last example I bring up is very complicated but very important. It's the example of Jack Johnson, the famed African-American boxer, first heavyweight African-American uh, boxer. If you watch the Ken Burns documentary, it's over five hours long, and he only mentions Mexico once in the entire documentary. And I think it's important to point out, again, the African-American connection to Mexico. Um, my point with this is during the same period, within months, that Juan Uribe makes a statement, Jack Johnson is in Mexico as well. And he is actively seeking African Americans to migrate there because he owned a land development company uh, in Mexico. If you watched Ken Burns' documentary, if you know anything about Jack Johnson, he was a very self-interested person, but he was proud of African American heritage. And it's very problematic because we have to really think about his motivation to suggest movement for African Americans. We have to remember that this was after the Mann Act. He was sought by the American government to be in prison because he crossed uh, imaginary state lines, right, with a white woman that was alleged to be related to prostitution, right? So it's further complicated. Was, was he recruiting African Americans as a way to uh, kind of destroy the U.S. system? Uh, was, he, was he really uh, sincere in his efforts? Uh, I, th I point to all these types of complicated and convoluted ideas within this propaganda as far as motivation is concerned as far as what, uh, thank you, what sincere intention was. So I hope, I mean, I have more examples, but I hope these kind of illustrate the complexity of, of the relationship between African Americans, Mexico, and the United States. And I'll just read my conclusion to sum up uh, what I've talked about. A key feature of this, the United States feared collaboration, especially if it could disrupt the racial hegemony the U.S. had long established and fought to continue. The real dilemma was whether there was a real threat or if it was created out of sheer paranoia. One thing was certain, minorities, immigrants sought, to gain, and immigrants sought to gain a steady hold of equality and a white America did not want that. In fact, white America wanted to uproot the possibility for equality and minorities like African Americans sought to uproot the racist hegemony that had long existed in the United States. With the assistance of Mexico, another group of people that was marginalized by the United States, African Americans fought to dethrone the racist system that was reaching out internationally. So to sum up, I believe there needs to be a reiteration, a re-examination, if you will, of the international relationship between Mexico and African Americans in the context of U.S. history. African Americans played a direct and indirect role regarding the relationship between Mexico and the United States during conflicts. This history had an effect on the United States' approach to African Americans and the development of the relationship between African Americans and Mexico. These events also helped also shape U.S. policies domestically and internationally in U.S. Mexico and the United States were at odds during the 19th and early 20th century, and the relationship had an, a, had an effect on African Americans. Furthermore, both nations attempted to use this to their advantage by promoting the possibility of a relationship or by deterring the relationship. 
Propaganda use was implemented by the United States, Mexico, and individual parties as the vehicle for different initiatives regarding African Americans. The question, the central question, was whether if a particular party was actually uprooted or whether this fight would continue well into the 20th century. Thank you. So, um, are you an American or an African? I think I am an American. I can trace my ancestors for four generations in South Carolina. In going to Africa, did you regard yourself as going home to your native land? By no means. After having given his former place of residence, his former occupation, and how much property he owned before migration to Liberia, this is how in May 1834, Thomas Sullivan Brown, a native Charlestonian from South Carolina, responded to the questions of the, ex of the examination committee of the Anti-Slavery Society. As he lamented the bad living conditions in Liberia, which resulted in the death of many colonists, among which were four of his relatives, two of his children, Brown's public testimony was to deal another detrimental blow to the American society's colonization scheme, which was starting to face fierce opposition in the early 1830s. An extensive analysis of Brown's testimony in Chatham Street uh, ch uh, ch Chapel, New York, and how it partook in the abolitionist propaganda is not the point of today's presentation. The reason why I selected this specific part of Brown's examination is that it puts into relief and calls into question the notion of African identity and the identification of African Americans with Africa as a homeland in the mid-19th century. The first Atlantic migration of Africans to Americans during the, trans during the transatlantic slave trade has become the hegemonic theoretical framework in African diaspora studies. However, as Brown's example shows, the migration of free African Americans in, 19th, in the 19th century and how the latter constitu uh, constituted a specific diasporic experience has received little notice by scholars. By combining a theoretical and historical approach, as well as by utilizing various case studies, my paper endeavors to show the, the transnational migratory experience of free African Americans during the antebellum period complicates the black African Atlantic diasporic <coughs> paradigm. If we exclude migration to Canada, how are, the, how are the notions of racial minority and racial essentialism complicated by the fact that in the 19th century, African Americans migrated to host countries that had a black majority, Haiti, Jamaica, Liberia? Did the creolized identity of the immigrant population facilitate its integration in Canada or the West Indies, the fact that there were Creoles, or make it more difficult in West Africa? To what extent did cultural, social, religious, and racial factors if we consider that many migrants were mixed race, constitutes deci uh, decisive determinants in the diasporic experience of African American migrants. What was, the demographic, what was the demographic importance of this migration? Did migrants settle permanently in their host country? Was the notion of homeland redefined in the case of African Americans settling in Africa? Did African American expatriates have a sense of longing for the United States? Did they maintain transnational contacts? So these are some of the many questions that I address in my paper. So instead of reading the whole paper, I'll just give you a brief, uh, I'll go through the main points that I develop in my paper. So I first look at the uh, well, theor well, theoretical framework of uh, the diaspora studies. I won't go through this because I think you're all <laughs> specialists in the, the purpose of uh, uh, this conference will be to look at the way this um, theory has evolved over time. But I do um, focus on the fact that the uh, African-American migration of the 19th century has been largely ignored in terms of 
questions of circulation, and this is what I try to address in my paper, and seeing how these African-American migrants, uh, what was their diasporic experience in, these, uh, in the Atlantic world, to put it <laughs> shortly, okay? The, uh, I try to show in my paper, I use the, um, um, sorry, in the paper I use the Zeleza's formula, which is the, the relationship between the, di the dispersal and diasporization. So the relationship between first the dispersal and then the diasporization and how this affect, how the, the African Americans of the 19th century, what was their experience in, in that um, regards. And I also uh, look at how the questions of uh, African American identity complicated the, this diasporic experience because, and this uh, is uh, echoes the round table that I just uh, <laughs> assisted to, the complexity of the African American identity and how this was um, made the experience somewhat uh, particular. So what I do in the first <coughs> parts of my paper is I go through the question of African-American migration in the 19th century. Maybe I want to keep track of the time. <laughs> Three more minutes? Oh really? Well, okay, so I keep track. Oh, I, I don't keep track of the time, sorry. The, the, the idea is, well, I look at the African-American migration uh, during the 19th century. I mainly show that there were three main places of destination, that is to say, Liberia, Haiti, and Canada. There were some projects to send them to Central Africa, some went to Jamaica, but we'll say that the three main places of destination were Canada, Liberia, and, and Haiti. And I look at the, their experience there by, um, by using some first-hand testimonies of s either settlers, but also some testimonies that are sometimes mediated by agents of colonization societies or, uh, or abolitionists. And so I also try to link this to the question of propaganda, as you just said. And uh, so this is what I tried to show in my paper. I move on on the question of the specificities of the African-American population in the 19th century. And I show that, for instance, mixed race immigrants were reluctant to go to Liberia. And they had to be convinced that they should go to Liberia just as white ministers had done before them. I also show that the question of um, political instability in Haiti uh, pushed many immigrants to return to the United States. And I also show that, in fact, many uh, African-American immigrants who stayed in Haiti ended up being day laborers, whereas they had initially intended to become landowners, because this was related to political situation of the island, which didn't really um, in, well, make it possible for them to acquire land. Let me just uh, wrap it up uh, quickly. I also look at the question of Canada and how many African Americans chose to pass when they travel north. So this is interesting too. And, uh, and I have some specific examples which I, uh, <coughs> which I mentioned in my paper. Finally, the last part of my paper is dedicated to the question of studying these experiences because we speak of black African diaspora, but it's sort of very, uh, in a sort of generic way. And it's difficult to have uh, f uh, sources that r really uh, relate these experiences. And I try to propose some methods of, uh, of dealing with this scarcity of sources, namely by writing collective uh, biographies and <coughs> trying to fill in the missing information by using the context. And I'm wondering if this is a feasible and uh, I would say legitimate and scientific <laughs> uh, way of uh, doing, um, well, of, of studying this population, in fact. Uh, I'll stop here because I think that I've uh, my time is up, and thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be more than happy to <laughs> give you more information later on. Thank you. And for purpose of records, I'm presenting on behalf of Joseph Akimbi, who unfortunately cannot be here because of some circumstances beyond his control. And uh, his paper, which I am presenting now, is entitled The Search for Greener Pasture Abroad, and he is reviewing modern migration of Nigerians to the United States of America. 
In the paper, he reveals the causes of aspects of modern migration from the less developed states of Nigeria to the developed state of the United States of America. And the, the reason for which he gave for this is that uh, the, the search for education, employment, and better living standards occasioned by the contemporary problem of the Nigerian states. And uh, another reason he gave is, I mean, for, for the movement from Nigeria to the US is because of the globalization and integration of um, the world economy economic and uh, political development failures in Nigeria. And uh, in going on, it says, it's against this backdrop that the paper tends to interrogate the upsurge increase in the number of Nigerian diaspora in the United States of America during the era of new globalization, especially in the 1990s. And uh, to review or to, to go on in this study, he has, uh, divided the paper into about five uh, parts. The first part is the introduction. The second focuses on its rising African diaspora in the United States of America. The third deals with its rising Nigerian diaspora international migration into the United States of America, which is an overview. And then the search for greener pasture in the United States of America since 1990. And he gave the example of Nigerian diaspora and why the, first, uh, the fifth part is the conclusion. In, his, uh, in dealing with the historicizing African, African diaspora in the United States of America, he gave some uh, definitions. And he used the definition of the United States Department, which says diaspora is described as migrant group that share the following features, dispersion, whether voluntary or involuntary, across socio-cultural boundaries and at least one political border. A collective memory and myth about the homeland, a commitment to keep the homeland alive through symbolic and direct action, the presence of the issue of return, although that, that, that might not be necessarily so, because some of them might want to just stay and uh, maybe later on become native or uh, uh, it's people of uh, the, the states. Although, again, that one also does not really necessarily mean so because they remain immigrants, even though they are, they, they are part of the uh, people in a, the United States of America. And he gave another definition, of, but this time from the, the African Union. And he says the African Union defines diaspora as consisting of people of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality. And these people are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of African Union. Again, that one might also uh, be questionable because once they leave the continent of Africa, they might not necessarily want to come back or they might want, since what they have come for or what they have gone for in the state is to search for greener pasture, which is a better living standard. Some of them might not want to come back to Africa or maybe they might stay longer in America before going back. And they gave reasons for these uh, migrations. He says, with the 1965 U.S. Immigration and Nationality Act, the number of African diasporas has uh, continued to increase. According to figures from the Immigration and Naturalization Services, the number of African immigrants to the United States has greatly increased from about 109,000 between 1961 and 1980 to almost 532 between 1981 and 2000. This new immigrant can be found in major metropolitan areas in states like New York, Texas, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, and California, even up to small towns in Idaho, <laughs> Iowa, and Maine. Even states like North and South Dakota were, that were only distant memories in the minds of many African immigrants to the United States in the 60s and 70s have become homes to many Africans. 
the increased number in the, uh, the increase in the number of African immigrants since the beginning of the new millennium in the United States has been unprecedented. The accelerated increase has been attributed to the effect of globalization as well as the U.S. immigration policy. And among these African immigrants in the States, Nigeria constituted the largest group. As of 2004, up to 3.24 million Nigerians were in the States. Uh, while historicizing Nigerian diaspora, and then given the overview of uh, the international migration to the uh, United States of America, he, the, the author says that the major factor responsible for the phenomenon of large number of immigrants in the United States in America, uh, in particular uh, since 1960, has been attributed to the emergence of uh, the state's re uh, relaxation of the immigration policies from that period, which is hinged on the need for labor uh, for industrial development. With respect to the United States in particular, the 1965 law, which is also referred to as the Hart Seller Act, losing restriction on immigration based on geography, which has limited immigration of non-whites. It also instituted policies that emphasized family reunification and professional qualifications. The new law introduces labor certificate and occupational preferences that favored immigrants with desired skills regardless of origin. And another notable change was allowing US-born children of foreigners to file petitions for legal admission of their parents, which means that foreigners who had children in the United States, maybe while as students or working visas, can apply for legal permanent residence through their young ones. Uh, in addition to the 1965 Act, several other revisions of immigration laws fostered increased international immigration from Africa and especially uh, Nigeria. For instance, the Immigration and Nationality Act Amendment of October 20, 1976 made it easier for foreigners to obtain visas to study or reunite with family or to even market their skills. Another act which uh, allows um, Nigerians or Africans to come to the United States is the Refugee Act of March 17, 1980, which uh, fundamentally changed U.S. refugee policy to conform with the U.N. Protocol on Refugees and provided for 500,000 visas annually. This deflected the emphasis on admitting only refugees from communist countries which the United States opposed in the Cold War and initiated flows from the horns of Africa, especially Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea, where civil and international conflicts were displacing thousands of people. Another law which allows the easy, so to say, movement from Africa to uh, the United States of America is the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act which made it possible for uh, undocumented immigrants living in the United States to apply for legal status. Some 35,000 sub-Saharan Africans and 100,000 residents from the English-speaking Caribbean obtained legal status through this IRCA uh, law. The 1990 Immigration Act increased the number of immigrants admitted on the basis of skills for U.S. jobs. It also introduced the diversity visa lottery to admit immigrants from countries not well represented among the U.S. immigrant population. Although originally envisioned as a way to bring in more Europeans, such as the Irish, who did not have close relatives in the United States who could sponsor them, the diversity visa was a boon for Africans and especially Nigerians who want to, uh, to immigrate. Between 1998 and 2006, Sub-Saharan Africans received 27% of the diversity visas awarded by the United States, of which immigrants from Nigeria constituted the highest. Which, this shows that fundamentally, Nigeria remains one of the major countries in Africa that has continued to be increasingly involved in this uh, international 
migration worldwide. This could be seen as analyzed earlier in the growing number of people yearly in comparison with other African countries. Now, while large majority of Nigerian diaspora left the country, he wants to now give reason for why uh, Nigerians leave their homeland to come to the United States of America. And he says, while large majority of Nigerian diaspora left the country due to low probability of gainful employment, mainly through visa lottery to the United States of America, where uh, there is more opportunity for, to find some sort of job, others who were highly skilled and professional in their different fields also left Nigeria due to poor salaries and wo uh, poor working conditions. This development has made the United States over the last few years to be known as the major center of abstraction of international labor migration. And he, the authors cited uh, Akomu, who buttress this argument by analyzing the salary being paid to Nigerian professors in comparison with other countries. In 2000, a 2007 survey conducted by the National Universities Commission found out that a full professor in Botswana earned $27,000 per annum. In Namibia, $21,000 and or between $21,000 and $35,000. And in South Africa, between $58,000 and $75,000. While in Nigeria, even with all the adjustments that the academic staff union of universities uh, was able to negotiate back then, a full professor still earned just about 12,000 per annum in 2006. This di discrepancy contributes to uh, why some decided to migrate. Yeah. So, in conclusion, the, 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 the foregoing has shown that the search for greener pasture abroad contributed greatly to the influx of Nigerian diaspora into the United States, especially since the 90s. And the international migration has been hinged on some fundamental factors, which include realization in the United States uh, immigration policy, the phenomenon of new globalization, the push and pull factors, among other things. Despite the fact that Nigerian diaspora are contributing to the development of their home country through remittances, among others, the flight of professionals and skilled people migrating from the country every time has seriously implicated on uh, the economic growth of the country in no small measure. Besides, it is imperative to point out that no matter how remunerative migration might be, it cannot solve the problem of Nigeria's underdevelopment. As argued by the Hungo, uh, 2007, though individual Nigerian migrants and their kin may become better off, their places of origin will largely remain backward or underdevelopment or underdeveloped because migration and remittances which they are making to, to, to their families will not enable the country to escape poverty and underdevelopment. Therefore, he now uh, made a recommendation which says Nigeria government in particular need to urgently address the structural problem of persistent poverty and unemployment, insecurity, poor working condition of workers, extremely high level of dissatisfaction, high cost of living, poor working condition, growing lawlessness, and politically motivated violence. He also said that uh, the contribution of Nigeria in diaspora to their host country has been uh, very positive in the sense that uh, the, the, the posi uh, positive contribution are noticeably in the areas of education, health, science, and technologies, among others. But while this uh, laudable role have, has contributed to the successful integration in the United States, it has left some major gaps in both the social and economic standard of Nigeria. Thank you.
first presenter, I'm sorry I didn't catch her name, but and I walked in a little late, so sorry if I ask you to repeat something. But um, at the end, you talked about wanting to kind of move at the idea of Afropolitanism Afro outside of this, the narrow framework that, for the reasons of the criticisms that you talk about. And one of the things that I wondered if you had looked at, first of all, was maybe thinking about the intersection of music and fashion, which is a big thing. Um, for a lot of the musical, including like Blitz the Ambassador, but, but others who are going back and filming uh, in Africa, in different African cities, um, the kind of designers and thinking of the designers and working with local designers is a, maybe a way of thinking outside of that, like sort of Eurasian, or um, Eurasian, sorry, I'm thinking that's the other panel, the Euro, Euro American uh, confines. Um, one thing, like, and another thing that you might think about in comparing and trying to m push into Africa also, is maybe thinking about how like American artists engage, like Blitz, engage, Blitz is Ghanaian, but engage with African artists. For instance, Beyonce, who filmed a video using Mozambican dancers, compared with, her, with Solange, who also went, went and filmed there. Like, how are these mainstream and not mainstream artists engaging with um, Africans? And the way in, which they're engaging, are they then, so you might argue that Solange, Solange's video, where oh, she's got, sorry, local people, <laughs> you're right, you're right. In any case, I'm just thinking like, there are some, oh, here, good point, that's it. There are some really useful comparisons um, in that process. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about fashion and then like those comparisons. Mm -hmm. so, my, my question is very short uh, to Ian Walker. Does the same sense of recreating uh, no. space within Zanzibar. Does that also include, uh, happen in the Comorian communities in France? Okay, quick answer for one or two. <laughs> okay, um, I have definitely thought about that, and in the actual paper I do touch on it a little bit. Um, when I describe just Blitz, the way he was dressed when he showed up to mm -hmm. our interview, and the way he dresses himself when he gives concerts in New York City, for example, which is where I've seen him. Um, he definitely, I mean, even from the way he designs, I didn't get to discuss this, but he likens himself to be a visual artist as well. So from his concert poster to his album cover art, he's the one, he's the mastermind behind all of that. Um, and if you were to take a look at it, you can definitely see the influences of like Ghanaian wax prints, for example. Um, and he definitely, he even wears those when he performs. But he kind of, even then, he still blends um, sort of like Western hip hop aesthetic with um, contemporary African trends. But um, you, if you were to listen to like an interview that he recently gave on NPR, he's, he's shouting out the names of these like Ghanaian fashion artists. Mm -hmm. And um, even when you were talking about Salon, she recently partnered with, um, I can't remember, William Opsi. Um, it's the, it's the, uh, Nigerian American sisters who are fashion designers and she's recently collaborated with them so there you are definitely seeing a lot of mainstream popular culture collaborations between African Americans and West Africans <laughs> which is sort of like the inspiration for another side project that we can talk about at lunch maybe um, but yeah it's definitely something that that I'm interested in exploring um, and yeah, my question, sorry my question is just do you see that sorry, no. I was just do you see like Blitz and Solange as the Afropolitan subjects, or do you also see those in designers with whom they're engaging as Afropolitan? Um, I think that would be a case-by-case -case basis. I think the, the premise for Afropolitan is being of African descent. Um, I don't think right now that conversation includes African Americans like Solange. So Blitz, definitely, he considers himself, and I would consider him an Afropolitan, not so much Solange. Okay. Um, but certainly some African fashion designers, I think, would fit into that into that um, description. And Dean? Uh, briefly, yes. Uh, there are about 250 associations, more associations in France, and about half of them are explicitly village-based, and a lot of the rest are very much dominated by the people of the village. But they don't have quite the same uh, customary relationship, um, probably because of the French context, I think. Yeah. All right. So thank you, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah.